Thank you, Ken. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unity Las Cruces virtual Sunday service celebration where God is good all the time and all are welcome, safe and loved. I'm Helen Wright. I'm the Minister Coordinator for Unity Las Cruces, and I'm here today with Reverend Tanya, and together we form the spiritual ministry team for Unity Las Cruces. So now I'm going to invite Reverend Tanya to, to do our uh, spiritual reading from today for today. Thank you, Helen. Today's spiritual reading comes from a, a, an excerpted extra, excerpt from a blog by Dr. Joe Dispenza entitled Accessing the Heart's Intelligence. From ancient cultures today, like a thread through the needle of time, the heart appears as a symbol and source of health wisdom, and intuition. As a symbol, it transcends time, place, and culture, and it's commonly accepted that when we are connected to the heart's inner knowing, its wisdom can be used as a source for love and higher intelligent guidance. Beyond its obvious imperative in sustaining life, the heart is not simply a muscle or a physical pump that moves blood throughout the body, but an organ capable of influencing and directing one's emotions, morality, and decision-making ability. Thank you, Dr. Dispenza. Now is always the time, the perfect time, for us to channel love, healing, and peace for world coherence. Thank you, Helen. And thank you, Tanya. <clears throat> The theme of, of being heart-centered, the heart and healing is going to weave throughout our service today. And our speaker today is Lillian Pilot, who is the Science of Mind practitioner. And also she will be providing the meditation and the music when we get to that part of our service. So now for some good news, I'm handing it over to Ken. All right, thank you, Helen. I've got a little bit of a story to talk about, which I think is really good for all you weekend warriors out there in case you just want a little inspiration to continue what you're doing. This one is off the Good News Network. It basically is a story about a, a, currently a 70 year old gentleman uh, working in a small village in India. And I can't pronounce his name properly, so I'm just gonna try it, but I think it's Bahoya. And he's been working for the last 30 years, that's three decades to accomplish what this story is all about, which is to build a four foot wide, three foot deep canal that is three kilometers long, about a mile and a half, so that he can collect rainwater and funnel it into his village's pond so they can have some water in the drought ridden areas on the far eastern side of India. So I've got a little bit of a video to go along with this, but this is from the Good News Network and I think it's really cool. There's not a lot of, um, words along with the video, but it kind of gives you a layout of how things are in their village and how things are set up with uh, what they're having to work with. So if you don't, don't mind, hang on just a moment. I'm going to push that over and see if we can get this to work.
इतना दिन से ही काम कर रहे थे किस बार से ही ये काम कर रहे थे बकरी चढ़ते छुट्टी भेटी था फिर खटा ली मौका खटा ली तो दिन साल खटा ली जाड़वा में साझ ला खटा लिया Thank you, Ken, and thank you for that inspirational uh, good news story for today. Wow, the power of vision. So now, now, now let's take a moment of gratitude and be grateful for all of us, for, for all of us who are Unity of Las Cruces. So everyone who enlivens this church, everyone who's here on the call today or watching the YouTube video later, um, everyone who attends the Daily Word on Wednesdays, and then everyone working behind the scenes, the board and social media outreach, the prayer chaplaincy, uh, people who are always praying, the musicians and speakers, and the technology of Zoom and YouTube and email. So thank you all for your the vibrations of your prayer and the energy that lifts this country, this world, this universe and allows more love, more light to flow, and more healing energy to flow to others and all of humanity. So thank you all. And now let's just take a moment and prepare for our opening prayer. We are centered in the divine love, the oneness the one power and presence in the universe, God the good. And centered in divine love. We appreciate and feel that power of spirit in and through and as us, moving through us in every action and thought and feeling throughout our day. And we're grateful for this energy, this power, this one power of the universe. This is a healing energy that heals us on all levels of our being, heals us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, opening us up to more of the reality and knowledge and living our oneness with each other. And we're grateful to be able to come together and join with our hearts our minds and in spirit and especially focusing on our heart and our ability to open with compassion and love to each other and as we focus on the heart and focus on healing this day we embrace each other in our, in our spiritual community that opens and widens and expands to hope to hold the whole of the world in light and love and life, abundant life, and wholeness. And for all of this, we are so grateful, and so grateful to God, our one source, and so it is. Amen. And now it's time to invite and introduce John Powers, who will bring us the daily word, and today's, today's daily word is all about healing. The Daily Word for Sunday, November 8th, 2020. The affirmation is, I embrace the healing flow of divine life. If my body experiences any kind of health challenge, I turn within to release all fear and all concern as I affirm that illness is not part of my true identity. I remember that wholeness is my birthright as a spiritual being. I surrender any anxiety as I fill my consciousness with healing thoughts. My mind's eye sees each cell of my body aglow with the energy of divine life. In prayer, I express appreciation for all of my body's marvelous functions. I commit to taking time to bless my body with rest, exercise, and good nutrition. I speak affirming words of truth 
to encourage my body's healing response. I give thanks for the healing that I know is already on its way to me. I am grateful to receive healing and know wholeness. The scripture is from John, uh, verse 10, line 10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And the affirmation is together, I embrace the healing flow of divine life. And so it is. So it is, and thank you, John. And next, we have our unity affirmation, which today is our intention statement with Reverend Tanya. Our intention statement, to create a sacred space where all who enter feel the presence of God, the joy of God, where all feel welcome, safe, and loved. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Lillian Pilot. Lillian Pilot, she describes herself and says that she spent much of her life as a spiritual seeker. She's an artist, writer, speaker, teacher, and musician. For 10 years, Lillian was part of the CSL Edmonton Music Ministry and earned her practitioner's license in 2012. As a singer-songwriter, she has performed all over North America with four recordings to her credit. And she's a two-time finalist for the Empower Positive Music Awards. She also trained in the use of sound and music and healing and has a degree in arts administration. She was a licensed practical nurse, was a property manager for many years, and if you go back far enough, I did not know this about her, she was even a welder in a truck trailer manufacturing company. She's an avid traveler and has lived in several countries and explored many more. All of these have informed her spiritual journey. She's now running a nature retreat with her husband, Doug, and has opened a small art gallery at The Domes and is happily nestled in the loving arms of Center for Spiritual Living of Las Cusas and Unity of Las Cusas. So um, look forward, we're looking forward to hearing her inspiring words and please help me welcome Lillian Pilot. Good morning, I'm Lillian Pilot and as always it's my very great pleasure to be here today. This month we're contemplating what it means to be a compassionate conduit. And as usual, the subject matter while I was writing this talk got up close and personal. I found myself looking at my life, looking at myself, and wondering whether or not I'd always been the person I want to be, or even the person I thought I was. And the word no kept showing up. I realized that much of what concerned me stemmed from the infirm human mind, the inconsistency of mind. You know, I used to, uh, I used to think I was sharp as a tack, and I was starting to come to the realization I was actually sharp as a marble. So I had this fantastic idea. It was one of those stroke of insight things. Um, you know, to, to write this talk about, and I didn't write it down, and it went away. It's probably hanging out with all the other things I didn't write down. And I told my husband, and he said, well, what'd you do that for? I don't know, so I could practice compassion. When I write a talk, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. The, um, the picture is whole, it's complete, it already exists in mind, and I, I put the framework together, and then I, I start turning over all the bits and pieces that I've gathered, and I put them in the right place, and if I'm really lucky, it comes together and makes the picture. I write the first draft usually weeks before my speaking date, but that's where the problem starts, because I have now lots of time to putter and go down rabbit holes. For example, did you know that the letter E is actually the most used letter of the alphabet. I thought it might be N because that's the letter that keeps sticking on my keyboard, but no, it's E. You might be aware of a book called 
Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. He's a wizard at time management. And he writes about how we set ourselves up for failure by procrastinating. And I want you to know I'm no average procrastinator. I am a pro procrastinator. Anyway, he says you have to organize what's on your plate, uh, make a list of the things you have to do, and put the most difficult or unpalatable things first, and then do those things first. Eat that frog. And while I was remembering about this book, I remembered also that I no longer have a hard copy of it. So I downloaded the PDF and I started reading it. Turns out I'm not very good at eating frogs. I could feel myself at this point sliding down that slippery slope into self-judgment. This is how I moved from looking into the deep well of compassion into the deep well of my own foibles. Is any of this sounding familiar to anybody? A friend of mine recently sent me a little video clip. I got quite a giggle out of it. There's this little old lady and she says, I don't know for sure how many cookies it takes to be happy, but so far it's not 27. And I got, I got quite a chuckle out of that, but the fact is, regardless of what kind of cookie it is, if we are unhappy, there aren't enough cookies to fill that void. If we don't value ourselves, how are we supposed to look at other people with loving kindness? Active compassion is the desire to alleviate another's suffering, but it starts at home. Compassion can only remain an intellectual idea if we can't move into our own hearts and practice kindness towards ourselves. So, compassionate conduits. So, well, a conduit is something that enables flow. So to be a compassionate conduit allows the flow of love and kindness and service without obstruction, without judgment. We have to get over ourselves, remove this compulsive concern with I, me, and mine. It's an obstruction. And I think compassion is something that we reveal to ourselves. And the seeds of this softness lie within all of us. But many of us are not living fully as compassionate beings. And maybe to really, really deepen this quality, we need faith. To live in faith, we need to not live in fear. To live fearlessly, we need to have a strong sense of who and whose we are. We need to know we are divine beings having a human experience. We need to know we are the body of Christ consciousness on earth. We need to believe in this aspect of ourselves. And as we accept the truth of our being, we can stop identifying with pain. And it doesn't mean we'll never experience it, it but it can't be our identity or else we will become conduits for pain heart open, knowing that love is handling the situation, this is where we step in. As Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, points out, compassion is a verb. It's not a thought or a sentimental feeling, but rather a movement of the heart. Isn't that beautiful? Compassion places us in someone else's shoes. It's the ability to perceive someone is doing the best they can, even though their best might not live up to our self-imposed standards. Compassion is without judgment. It simply loves. It holds space. And sometimes that is the only action needed. And this is an important point. We've been trained to believe we've got to run around and do stuff and prove that we're, you know, prove our action. But that's not true. Forcing our assistance on another person might provide a bomb for our own, own egos, but it's not helpful. And as Reverend Bonnie recently discussed in her talk about um, boundaries, it can even be harmful. In all the therapeutic and energetic practices I've ever been exposed to, there is one common theme. We do not work with someone without permission. 
And sometimes simply being present with someone is the most powerful, compassionate response. So as I said, those seeds of compassion lie within all of us, but what triggers us to actively open our hearts to another's suffering? What is traumatic or difficult for one person might be completely benign to another. What's a non-event for you could be a huge trigger for me as the witness. So what moves us to compassion? Every person in this world is born into a unique condition and has their own unique wiring. So there is this huge potential for differing beliefs around trauma and suffering. I, um, I have a really good friend who, whose home life was so bad, she was living on the streets by the time she was 12. She was molested more times than she can even count. And finally, as a young adult, she was horribly and brutally um, attacked and beaten. She is well-adjusted and happy and loving and open-hearted and giving, intelligent, active, vital woman. And if you met her, you'd think, well, there's somebody who came from the most loving, secure, and healthy home environment. She's the, obviously the product of that kind of a home, but she's not. And another friend had kind of a similar uh, upbringing and is also very uh, kind and open-hearted, but is triggered by everything. It's just, it's, you know, like, w you know, walking through a field of landmines trying to navigate with this person. So it's a very, very individualized journey, this, uh, this trauma business. And our childhood events are carried forward and they remain in the subconscious until they're triggered. So here we are, we're all grown up and some situation has brought out something we didn't even know was there and all of a sudden, boom, we're a mess. And our friends and our family and coworkers, strangers, they're all witness to our emotional baggage and then they have to decide how to respond. Will they roll their eyes? Here she goes again. Will they pat us on the arm and say, don't worry, everything will be all right? Will they ask, how can I help you? What do you need right now? Or will they simply look into our eyes and say, I'm here. There's an expression in Spanish, and I hope I do this correctly, caras vemos, corazones no sabemos. We see faces, we don't know the hearts. And Sharon Salzberg speaks to this in The Force of Kindness. That's, excuse me, that's the book uh, that Tina read from. Uh, it's a wonderful little book. I really get a lot out of it. And she says, um, it's a big, rich, intricately textured world, and we often miss most of it because our gaze has narrowed to ourselves, to some facet of how we are appearing in the world. And I know that if I'm focused inward, I get stuck in my brain. When I emote from the Rolodex in my subconscious mind instead of from the heart, I shut off the flow of love. Reverend Martha Quintana noticed this actually at a prayer meeting uh, when we were at the con convention in Chapala a couple of years ago. I walked into the room heart open and everybody responded in kind, but somewhere along the line listening to stories and doing group uh, treatment prayer, I got triggered and it was so subtle, I didn't even notice it. But I moved into my head and they all lost the connection. Reverend Martha asked if she could share what she'd observed and pointed it out right then and there. And I struggled with it a little bit. It took me a while to process, but it was in fact a compassionate act. She was letting me know in real time the shift in energy from heart to head didn't serve me or anyone else. She was direct, but kind. It was simple. So act of compassion has a lot of variables. How will we be received? How far are we willing to go? What if helping someone puts us at some level of risk? Then, then what do we do? Are we going to do it? 
it all requires faith, but growing faith into a viable commodity means we have to unpack some human traits that are pretty hardwired. There's a professor of neuroscience, R.N. Trinatan, suggests that the human agenda is basically security, that anticipation of threat is ingrained in our software mind. From cavemen to crosses to pandemics, there have been threats to our safety, so the evolutional objective of the mind is security. But this flies in the face of our capital T, true nature, our true nature of being, our, our true essence, the aspirations of the heart, love, positivity, looking out for others, oneness. Sri Natan says, the mind will always keep thinking, projecting forward, preparing itself. Since the primary goal is safety, in order to be ready, the mind will churn away imagining improbable future events. There could be a terrorist attack or cheaters. Your house might, house might burn down. You could be in an accident. There could be a pandemic. It's endless. And consider the effect on your life and on the world of this constant fear chugging away at a subconscious level. So how do we grow compassion when our mind's architecture is based on the principle of self-preservation? Imagine you see someone in trouble and you want to help, but there's potential for personal harm. What do you do? I think the truth is that we may be hardwired for security, but we are heartwired for love and compassion. And I think it's possible that this dichotomy has kind of grown into a pervasive global disorder. Without a firm conviction of our true nature, people have allied themselves with the default mechanisms in the reptile brain. They've closed themselves off so they won't get hurt. We must decide to be faithful. This is how we have to live, through our own belief that we are the essence of love and that this life is happening for us and not to us. Our indwelling compassion can blossom. We can give what we have to give because we know that we are held in the arms of infinite supply. In this materially, uh, material world, we are the force field of realignment. So now what is that effect on the world? walking with love and compassion instead of fear. There are some cynics who dismiss compassion as a touchy-feely um, or perhaps a rational thing, but scientists have actually started to map a biological basis for compassion, which suggests another deep evolutionary purpose. Re research is showing that when we feel compassion, our heart rate slows down. We start to secrete oxytocin, the bonding hormone, and regions of the brain that are linked to empathy, caregiving, and feelings of pleasure actually light up. So there is this impetus to um, want to approach and care for other people. The reptile brain may be wired for safety, but from the heart, comes the impetus for the activity that is required for evolution, and that is compassion. Animals know this already. A few weeks ago, I woke up and I wasn't feeling very well, and I, I curled up on my side in bed, and our kitten, Leo, jumped up and curled up against me. Now, he's not supposed to be on the bed, but he was pushing his little body so hard against me, and I didn't feel like moving. And almost right away, I felt this wave, this download of warm energy come from his little body into me. And with, literally within a couple of minutes, I was feeling better. And I, I realized he was giving me energy. I was getting kitty reiki. And just mentally, I said, oh, Leo, that was amazing. Thank you. That was wonderful. And he lifted up his head 
And so tenderly, he reached out his little paw and he went boot on the end of my nose and then he got up and left. And I was like, <laughs> okay, animals know. That moment with uh, Leo Kitty was a miracle of active compassion and I might have missed it if I didn't already know that animals are compassionate conduits. I feel it when I'm caring for them. If that conduit is open, compassion flows both ways. That event opened a, something of a wellspring in me. I've been just feeling more loving and more giving. If you show up at the domes, you might even um, catch me walking around cradling a chicken and singing to her. And <laughs> I think they like it because they're starting to follow me around all over the place. There's a book called The Hidden Life of Trees. It's by a, a German forester named Peter Vorlieben, and he explains how trees use electrical impulses through the root systems to communicate. They also, interestingly, use smell and taste. For example, if a, a giraffe starts eating the African uh, acacia, the tree starts to release a chemical into the air and that warns other acacia trees that's carried on the breeze, and they start releasing this chemical, and giraffes don't like the taste of it, so the herd just moves on. And in other situations, um, if a leaf-eating insect shows up, that insect has a bit of saliva, and that starts to trigger another chemical uh, re that wafts in the air and attracts the predators that eat that insect. So in this way, the tree is uh, protecting itself and its neighbors. Trees actually care for each other. His, um, uh, Volibin's most astonishing observation was that they're social. They share nutrients via their root systems. Um, they're connected by what the scientific, scientific community is now calling the wood-wide web of soil fungi, and it joins trees in this intimate and intricate network. They actually need each other. Um, it takes a forest to create the best microclimate for uh, tree growth and sustenance, so they help each other to create this climate. His observation of tree life tree life completely changed the way that he was practicing forestry and he said when you know that trees experience pain and have memories and that tree parents live together with their children you can no longer just chop them down we humans get so bogged down in our inner lives we forget about the rest of the forest don't we and i think maybe it's time to be a tree I was going to make a t-shirt with that, but I realized the acronym would be BAT, and it's just after Halloween, and I thought that wouldn't work. But maybe trees are the bodhisattvas on earth. In uh, Buddhism, a deity who has attained enlightenment but devoted themselves to serving those on earth is a bodhisattva. They actually delay their entry into paradise so that they can serve and help mankind. And there are are many different bodhisattva, and each oversees a different need, wisdom, mercy, etc. Avalokiteshvara is the face of compassion. And one of her characteristics is that she manifests when and where needed. So she always presents herself in a form that's appropriate to the uh, situation. She could be a, a, a bartender or a drunk philosopher in the, in the bar. She could be a, a, a teacher in a classroom, a nurse, always responding in a form that is appropriate to the circumstances. So how is that? Every time a motorist stops to help someone at the side of the road, Avalokiteshvara has manifested herself. Every time a songwriter creates a piece of music that touches the hearts of thousands, Avalokiteshvara has manifested herself. Those characteristics of wisdom and compassion are the characteristics of all beings. We all have this potential. And when we see and hear the suffering of others and respond, the action step, respond to that suffering, we are the heads and arms of the Bodhisattva. I had an experience years ago it was shortly after I'd released my second recording. And I got a letter in the mail 
um, a young man who had been in my employ years before that said, you may not remember, but I used to work for you. You told me I had a drinking problem, and if I kept screwing up on the job, you would have to let me go, and I hated you. Thanks for writing, dude. <laughs> but I started going to AA, and my whole life turned around. Things were really good for a long time, but the last few years have been, have been really hard. Some very challenging things have happened, and I haven't thought that I was going to make it. I've even thought about taking my life. I just want to tell you, I bought your CD the other day, and the song, The Getaway, could have been written for me. It just turned me around. So I'm just writing to thank you, because twice now you've saved my life. Bodhisattva is everywhere. In the year 1206, there was a 23-year-old son of a wealthy merchant, and he went on a pilgrimage to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And when he got there, he was just astonished by the opulence, the lavishness inside, and the horrible poverty outside. And so he persuaded a beggar to exchange clothes with him, and he spent the day begging for alms. It was one of the great, uh, first great empathy um, experiments in human history. And after that, he founded a religious order working for the poor and for lepers. We know him now as St. Francis of Assisi. Now, everybody knows Mother Teresa, but how many of you know about the Texan who, in 1959, colored his skin to appear black to get a taste of what reality was like for an Afri African-American man living in the segregated Deep South? He experienced how white people just looked through him, or if they did look at him, it was with hatred. He was subject to verbal and physical abuse. And he wrote a book called Black Like Me, which gives the message, if only we could put ourselves in the shoes of others to see how we would react, then we might become aware of the injustices of discrimination and the tragic inhumanity of every kind of prejudice. There are many people who have taken extreme measures to enliven compassion in themselves and others, but do we really, do we really have to go to these lengths? Can we not just open our minds and our hearts and see all of life as one? Can we, can we not just do that together? There's um, an Indian sage known as Papaji, and, and he said, as long as there are two, there will be war. And he meant, as long as we carry that insidious sense of self and other, then we can objectify the other for our own ends. And there will be war in our hearts, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in the world. Thich Nhat Hanh has done so much in the modern world to simply articulate the core Buddhist teachings of mindfulness, kindness, and compassion. And I was reflecting on how he and so many other teachers have supported my journey, these deep teachings offered in a way we can all grasp, a, a mouth-watering taste of peace and kindness and joy. And when I fall into old thought patterns, I reach for these ideas, like the arms of the bodhisattva, they hold me. And for each day now that I struggle with my own humanness, I'm given another day to reach out and assist someone else. My practice is weak, but my heart soars knowing truth is setting me free. When I stumble now, loving wisdom catches me and whispers my name. What's this in my heart? Compassion filling me and all living beings. One day at a time, I am aware of my heart. I breathe in and out. We can shift from hardwired to heartwired, and the journey begins here. 
Thank you. And so I know, as I go deep in my own heart, I know for certain that there is only one, one being, one essence, one life force, one power for good, acting in and as and through me and every living being. I know that this life force is made of love. It is made of compassion. It is made of the natural instinct to help one another, to bring all up to a level playing field so that we can live in unity and harmony and peace, in comfort, in joy, to live as one. I imagine this harmonious planet. I imagine it all the time where we come and go with one another and it is seamless because everyone's needs are met. I imagine this compassion because I know that this compassion is the truth of who we are. I don't have to imagine that. I know that part. So I just continue to imagine that compassion being awakened and enlivened in every living being and working its way out as good in the world. And as I see the threads of this moving out, I am filled even more full with my own sense of compassion, with a sense of gratitude. There have been so many teachers who have come to show us the way, and we get to listen and learn and open and move. So as I live and move and have my being on this planet, that is my journey to continue to open my heart into the wellspring of compassion and be that person. So I give great thanks to all those who have come before to pave the way. I give great thanks to all those who are here now with open arms, the arms of the Bodhisattva holding us, holding us all and just reminding us of the truth of who and whose we are. And I release these words into the law knowing that this and much, much more is already done in the mind of the one. And so it is. these walls there's a whole world that's spinning and they say it's all about losing and winning but I know that's a lie this is only the beginning and the future is in our hands
Thank you for that beautiful heart-centered message of compassion and hope and healing from Lillian Pilot. Uh, we're so grateful for your words and prayers and that beautiful music as well, so relevant for the times that we're living in. So thank you. And now we have our prayer for faith with Kay Brilliant. Welcome to Unity of Las Cruces, where we know that God is good all the time. Please join me in prayer as we affirm our prayer of faith. God is my help in every need. God does my every hunger feed. God dwells within me, guides my way through every moment, night and day. I now am wise, I now am true, patient, kind, and loving too. All things I am can do and be through Christ, the truth that is in me. God is my health, I can't be sick. God is my strength, unfailing quick. God is my all, I know no fear, since God and love and truth are here. Amen. So our tithe recipient for this week is the Center for Spiritual Living. And we're so grateful that we can participate in that circulation of love and gratitude and flow and tithe. Welcome to Unity of Las Cruces, where we know that God is good all the time. Your love blessings can be made at the Unity of Las Cruces website or on the weekly email. You can mail your gift, donation, or tithe to the P.O. Box. Your gift is given in love, goes out to the others in love, and love returns tenfold. And so it is. And these are all of our methods of, of being able to tithe, for which we're very grateful. Our speakers in November, there's been a, a couple of changes. And so um, one thing I'm really excited about is our next week's speaker, and that's Reverend Gary Kanye. He's my um, mentor minister, and he's talking about the spiritual harvest. And so uh, after that, there will be myself, I will be speaking on um, reflections of gratitude as we move into Thanksgiving week. And then at November 29th, we will be experiencing a wonderful talk from Darian Mason. So we're looking forward to all of those. The Daily Word on Wednesdays continues and it's exciting. We keep having new people join us. So uh, you're very welcome to join the Welcome the Word on Wednesdays at 9.30. So again, so, so grateful that everyone could be here on this virtual so Sunday celebration and continue to reach out and connect with each other throughout the week and throughout. Have a really blessed week. Again, thank you for being with the service and you're welcome to join for more discussion and fellowship after our um, perfect protection followed by the peace song. Thank you. Please join us as we affirm the prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. Amen.
you. So be well, be safe and have a blessed week. Thank you.